Okay, so a graph is basically a representation of a system or the workings of the specific components of a system. So when we are looking at describing what a graph is, we are going to have some components, which are objects of some sort of system. So those are going to be represented by the dots, which are also known as vertices or nodes. And again, they're just your components of whatever system you are investigating. So, for example, if you were looking at a friendship group situation, the dots would be or representing human beings or your friend group. Each uh, vertice or node would be an individual person. And then you'll have your links between them would be the friendships between them. So there you would have your relationships in this case. So it's the relationship between the components and that whole piece together is your actual graph. So we have the conceptual understanding of a graph, but this is mathematics, so we need the mathematical definition of a graph. Now, in order to have the mathematical definition of a graph, we have to introduce some other mathematical definitions. And this stems from the fact that what we've seen is, okay, a graph is a bunch of components, and then a bunch of relationships between the components. Well, a bunch of things is usually a collection, and there is a specific word for a collection in mathematics referred to as a set. So a set is a well-defined collection of objects, and the well-defined is, you know, meaning that you are going to know exactly what's kind of in the set, and the set is usually has unique elements. And I'll discuss what is the elements of the sets and everything like that now. So let's start off by just, you know, putting some objects down. Uh, let's just go with some kitchen utensils. So we have, you know, a knife, a fork, and a spoon. Okay, and we're going to have this set of kitchen objects. So in this case, we're going to name it K for kitchen, or let's just name it A. So most of the time, firstly, when you name in a set, it's usually a capital letter. Okay, so we and I have a set of these kitchen objects. We're calling it A, and we're going to use squiggly brackets like that, and then you'd have your knife, your fork, and your spoon. Okay, so that would be your set representation. So it's a list of objects inside the curly brackets, and those lists of objects are only repeated once because they're unique elements. So when we refer to this, you know, the fork is an element, the spoon is an element, the knife is an element. So those are all elements of your set. Okay, now, there are some other things we need to know about sets, like representing them, like what are elements in the set, what are elements not in the set, um, a proper set, and so on, just so that we have the idea and we have the notation, because as you can see with the fact that a graph is a collection of objects, a lot of the ways that you represent sets will be replicated in the um, representation of graphs. So let's just switch over to you know letters because we are in mathematics now so let's have um, x and y and z okay so those are our objects and let's create a set with x and y so we have b is equal to x and y so that's saying that the set b has elements x and y so x and y are elements of B. So that is the symbol for elements of or X and Y are in B. Okay, so when you read that, X and Y in B, X and Y are elements of B. Right. Now, if we have to, you know, look at Z, for example, so Z is sitting by itself there, Z is not an element of B. Okay, so not an element of B. Okay, some other things that you will need to know is that you can have a set without any elements. 
So an empty set, and that would be just represented by say C is equal to open curly brackets and close curly brackets. So you can have a set without any elements that is referred to as an empty set. It's basically your trivial example um, for a set having no elements. However, just something to note that if you had a set like this, which is, let's call it D, and we said it's equal to curly brackets and that, that is not an empty set. That is a set consisting of the element of the symbol there. But you can also say or utilize this to represent an empty set, but again, you will not combine it with the curly brackets. The moment you combine it with the curly brackets and put it inside, it becomes an element. So this is not an empty set. It is a set with the element, um, the circle and the slash in for you, the slash zero. However, if it's just two curly brackets that are, have nothing inside of it, or just the slash zero, it is an empty set. So you're going to have to be very, very careful with your mathematical notation in regards to the interpretation of it. Okay, and this brings us to our definition of a graph, because now we know what a set is. A set is a collection of objects, and it's a nice mathematical way to represent a collection of objects. We know that a graph has a set of the components itself, the vertices or nodes, and it has a set of the relationships, the edges or the links. So now we need to just combo that into a definition, a mathematical definition. So once again, let's just start off with describing or talking about the fact that our components of our graph from our conceptual, the components were the objects of the system that we were investigating. Um, those would be a collection to form the graph, but we know that those are referred to as vertices or nodes. Uh, vertices is the official graph theory terminology, nodes is a lot of the time using computer science and so on. Okay, so we have the vertices or nodes. So the vertices set, we're going to refer to as V of the graph G. So remember how we spoke about that the set, uh, we define it using a capital letter. So here we've decided that the set of the vertices is the capital letter V, but we also describing it as it's the vertices set of the graph. So when we're talking about this, it's the vertices set of graph G. So we've also named the graph G. So this is basically just letting us know it's V of, you know, G. Then we also have the edges or the relationships. Let's start with the relationships. So the relationships between the components, there's a collection of them as well. And those are your edges, right? Or your links. And again, the edges is the graph theory terminology. The links is used a lot in computer science. So we're going to name the collection of the edges as E, so it's going to be the edge set of G. But now this is just something to take note of in that the traditional and the correct definition of a set is that they, it's a list, well, it's the elements and the elements are all unique. However, when you have graphs, you can have a situation where say you have, you know, there's your vertices and you have, oh, that wasn't great. Um, you know, a relationship line there, but you also have some other relationship occurring. So you end up having, you know, these things which are technically referred to as multiple edges. So you end up not necessarily having unique elements representing, you know, all your edges. So to keep it well defined mathematically, in other words, you know, to keep everything as nice as possible so that it fits all the mathematical definitions, we refer to the edge set as the multi-set, or we refer to it as a collection. 
so of edges and that is just to keep the idea that your edges can be repeated or non-unique and for a set when you list the elements of a set they need to be unique so to get around that we refer to it as a collection of edges or a multi-set of the edges so now when we look at the definition itself let's go back to the definition we first define a graph a graph G is equal to a pair, and that's what's happening there. It's, it's a pair representation. I'm sure you've um, seen coordinates before, kind of that like that, where it's showing you that they consist of two, you know, pieces of information, V and E, which consists of a set denoted by the VG. So here we're saying, okay, there's a set. It's the vertices set of the graph, and here we say a collection, you know of the edges of unordered pairs. Now, the unordered part is pretty necessary when we go into the um, more complicated definitions of graphs. So we're keeping this graph definition as broad as possible. So we'll be talking about labeling soon so that you can actually see what's going on. But the whole idea is your edges could actually have di um, direction. And if they have direction, they would be ordered because then you'll have a very specific path that you have to take, you know, through them. Uh, when we're talking about direction, it would be something like this, you know, that kind of a situation. Then you'd have to go from A to B. That would be an ordered edge. But in the definition of a graph, the most basic definition of a graph, it's going to account for the most, the, like the broadest scope of everything. So it's an unordered pair means it can either go from A to B or from B to A. So it's something like this. It doesn't tell you there's a specific approach. So it can either go be A to B or could be B to A in the representation. So that's where the unordered pairs is coming from. And we use U and V as basically placeholders. Like I just used A and B there. We usually use U and V instead of like A and B. And that's just a convention kind of a situation. And then they say of distinct elements of the vertice set. And that is because of how you actually get an edge. So for an edge to exist, you know, you have the situation of it needs a vertice there and it needs a vertice there. Because for a line, you know, when you're connecting dots, you actually have to have two dots to connect to create that line. So that's why we say it's unordered pairs of the distinct elements of the vertice set. So the vertice set is giving us, you know, all the possibilities that we can link up to represent our collection of edges. And again, each element of the vertice set is called a vertice and each element of the edge set is called an edge. But let's go through just, you know, some examples on how to label things and how to see how the vertices and edges and stuff work and how we can discuss them. Okay, so now we need to actually start showing you how you can represent a graph in set notation. So we're going to just start off with the example graph that we had previously, and we're just going to go through some of the ways that we can label it and then write it so that you can see how a graph looks without the actual diagram of the graph. So here we have, you know, your vertices and your edges. And the first thing we're going to do is you can label your vertices by just utilizing the alphabet. So with small letters. So you could just say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay, so that's the first way that you can do it. So you can label your vertices by just utilizing the alphabet. And now when we talk about the vertices set, we'll be saying that the vertices set of the graph G is equal to, and then we would just list all the vertices. C, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay, so there we go. We have, you know, the vertice set of the graph. Now, to describe the edge set of the graph, or the multi-set um, of the graph, we would have to well, there's a couple of things that we can do. We can either label the edges or we can utilize the vertices to represent, you know, 
the edge itself. And by that we mean we have, like in our definition of a graph, where we spoke about the fact there were unordered pairs of the vertices creating the edges, we can utilize that for our edge set. So we have an edge from A to B here, or B to A. So this would just be AB. So it'd be a pair of vertices A to B, and that would be representing our edge. And then here we have, you know, an edge which has A to D as, you know, it's creating it. So we have A to D there, and we can do all for all the rest. So B E, D E, this one is C D, F D, and G E. And now when we write out, you know, the collection of edges, we would have E, G, and then we would basically have to write all these pairs in. So A, B, B, E, D, E, A, D, C, D, F, D, G, E. And let's just quickly check that we have all of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we can close the set. Okay? So you can write the vertices by labeling the vertices small letters. And then you can label your edges as pairs of the vertices that make up the edge. So to have an edge, you have to have two vertices, right? So you would have that pair of vertices that make up the edge, and you can write that as pairs. So when you talk about pairs, remember it's the bracket situation. Okay. Now, obviously, that can be rather on the tedious side of life. So we can represent the edges by actually labeling the edges. So let's just do that. So I'm just going to remove all of this. And we would label the edges depending on what our outcomes are. Like if you're working with the edges a lot, then we'd label the edges and then, you know, utilize the labels. But again, it depends on what kind of math we're going to be doing. Like, is it worth the effort, basically? So we can label the edges and we could label the edges, you know, also alphabet. So we could start, you know, after H and continue on the alphabet. But Remember, if you do use the alphabet, you get kind of stuck after, you know, 26. So there is going to be a bit of an issue there. There is another thing that we can do. And instead of just using the alphabet letters, we can actually use a letter and then a numbering system. So we could use like E and then the subscript 1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6 and E7. Now when we had to write the edge set, we could actually have, you know, EG is equal to E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and E6, and E7. So you can label your items with one letter and then the indices a subscript is the indices or the number, like just numbering systems. You could also do something like that with your vertices. So you could, so instead of having, you know, your ABCs, you could have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, and V8. And then you'd have your vertices set would just be all of that. V5, V6, V7, V8. And obviously, if you were you're going to have it like this and you didn't label the edges, you would have to do that whole situation again of the pairs to get you, you know, your edge set of the graph. Okay, so then you go through the entire process again. V4. And so on. Okay, so 
things to note, you can label your graphs by having your vertices be um, small letters of the alphabet, or you could have, you know, uh, v and then your subscripts would be just you know numbering systems. You can also label your edges like that. Whether or not you'll label your edges is dependent on what you're actually going to be studying. Like, are you going to be studying the relationships and utilizing the relationships that often in your study in your mathematics, or are you just going to you know use them once or twice? If you use them once or twice, then there's no point in labeling them. But if you use them a lot, then obviously there is a valid reason for labeling them. Okay, so now we're just going to go through some of the definitions and descriptors related to vertices and edges. So the first one is a pretty straightforward one. It's the end vertices. So to have an edge, you have to have two vertices, right? Because an edge has to link to two objects in order for it to exist. It's a relationship between two objects. So the whole idea behind the end vertices is you have your edge. Your edge is UV in this case and u and v are your end vertices. They are the where, or where the edge stops, and that is the end. Um, I don't want to use the word endpoint because endpoint has a different um, meaning in graph theory. But end vertices of the edge are your terminal vertices of the edge, essentially. They are what makes up that edge. Okay, next up is adjacent vertices and edges. Now, the word adjacent you should be slightly familiar with from, you know, trig kind of a situation. It is going to be something that is next to it kind of a situational uh, idea. So, in regards to this, you would have a situation of if your vertice is connected to another vertice by some sort of relationship, it is adjacent to that vertice. So it's a direct relationship between that vertice and itself. So in this case, you'd have U and V are adjacent vertices in that example there because they have an edge between them. W and Z are adjacent vertices. But notice that W and V are not adjacent vertices. You know, Z and U are not adjacent vertices. Going to the second graph, the one just below it, you will have a situation of U and V are adjacent vertices, U and Z are adjacent vertices because they share an edge there, you know, and then W and Z are adjacent vertices. Now, edges are adjacent if they share a common vertex. So let's just rub that out for a second to go through it. So when it comes to edges, edges are adjacent if they share a common vertice. So unlike with vertices, there's a relationship between that vertice and the next one, and the relationship is very like solid, it's that line. For edges, they're just connected. So it's a case of uh, you are friends with someone. Let's just call them Bob, because that's the first name that came to my head. And Bob is friends with mark now in this situation you know the your relationship with bob is adjacent to mark's relationship with bob because bob is a common factor you know there is a connection there you know there is that that link so an edge is adjacent if they share a common vertice so let's go to the examples in the graph so the first graph has no adjacent edges if you look there there is no situation where the edges are linked to each other by a common vertice. In the second graph, we do have an adjacent edge. So that's edge one, that's edge two, and that's edge three. Now we have U is shared, it's common for you know E2 and it's common for E1, so E1 is adjacent to E2. So they share a common vertice, they share U. There is also the situation where, you know, you have E3 and E2, and they share a common vertice, and that is Z. So we have vertices adjacent if they share a connected edge, and edges are adjacent if they share a common vertice. 
Okay, next up we have the definition of incident. And for edges, incident edges and adjacent edges, you know, the similarity is right there. Edges are incident if they share a common vertex. But Incidence in relation to vertices is a slightly different definition. So a vertex is incident with an edge if the vertex is one of the end vertices of that edge. So in the situation or incidence, incidence is connecting you to the edges kind of a situation. So edges are incident if they share a common vertex and a vertex is incident with an edge. So we don't discuss vertices being incident to each other we discuss vertices being incident to an edge. Okay, so let's just go through that for an example. So edges are incident if they share a common vertex. So again, let's just go to that bottom graph because it's really helpful in this situation. So we have, you know, that UV edge is incident to the UZ edge because they share a common vertex. So UV and uz are incident edges okay next up let's look for an example where a vertice is incident with an edge if the vertice is one of the end vertices of that edge now this is basically just the case of you know you have this edge here it's wz it's incident to z it's also incident to w so z is incident with edge w z okay so it's just if it's an endpoint or well, not endpoint end vertice of the edge it is incident to that edge okay so once again if the vertice is an end vertice of that edge, it is incident to that edge. And edges are incident if they share a common vertex. So the definition for incident edges is the same as the definition for adjacent edges. Right, so next up we have a definition referred to as parallel or multiple edges. And this is just basically when you end up having two relationships between the same objects. So often when you're representing a system, it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same kind of relationship the entire time. You could have, for example, you know, friendship. So we, let's, let's model a system of friendship. But we can also model, you know, family relationships at the same time. So you can have double relationship with someone just by based on sometimes you are friends with family kind of a situation. So then you would have, OK, you have a friendship um, relationship and you have a family relationship that is two separate, you know, lines connecting you. So that is where the multiple or parallel edges come from. And in the example that you can see there, we have U and Z have an edge there and an edge there. And that is referred to as a parallel or multiple edge. You can have another one. We can add another one. We can let you, you know, add as many as we like kind of a situation. So you can have that situation where your relationships, there's a bunch of different kind of things that are, you know, being modeled in the system, which the graph is representing to allow for a situation where there are parallel or multiple edges. Uh, a more concrete kind of example is just thinking about, you know, just in your brain for a second, think about your neighborhood and think about how you would map your neighborhood and the roads in the neighborhood. So if it was directed, you would have, you know, lines for, you know, the one direction of the road and then you'll have a line for another direction of the road but if it was undirected you just have two lines so there will be two ways you know to get anywhere from the different lanes of the road okay then we also have a thing called a loop so you can actually have a situation where you are connected to yourself in a kind of lame example you can be your own friend so you would have a relationship with yourself that is on a friendship level so a loop is basically that kind of a situation. Now, just be aware that in computer science and stuff like that, 
often they'll use the term self loop instead of a loop and that's because a lot of people do get confused between a loop and a cycle you will find out what a cycle is in a few weeks time actually next week probably or the next session okay so an edge is basically a situation where it goes from its vert from one vert from like u the vertice u to the vertice u so yeah you have u you leave u you come back to u and you refer to it as u u kind of a situation so that is your edge and that is a, a loop or self loop okay so you may start noticing that the diagrams get a little bit confusing and things like that and sometimes you just want kind of like the broad outline of you know what's happening in your graph and one of the first things that you can start looking at for you know getting an idea of what your graph looks like without actually having the visual depiction of the graph is just the degrees of the vertex so the degrees of the vertex is going to be telling you the number of edges with that particular vertex as the end vertex and this is going to you know give you an idea of how much relationships that vertex has because remember your edges are usually some sort of relationship and the relationships mean something so it's like a density of the number of relationships and so on so in regards to this we're going to look at the degrees there's different ways that we can write it so let's just start off with the basic way so we say the degree of the graph g for the vertice v so when we talk about that we have the degree representing hey it's the degree then we specify what graph it comes from so that subscript is the graph it comes from and then we specify what vertice we're looking at so it could be vertice u vertice v w or z in this situation if we know what the graph is so it's not going to be ambiguous at all so there's not like multiple graphs in the situation we can drop out off the subscript g so that is when you know we know what the graph is what the graph is we're looking for and there can be no confusion about it and then you also have the situation where you can just use dv so we've discussed that dv and again this is when the graph is very well known and the mathematical notation of the author you know it is well known that d is only going to represent the degree but just be careful with that because you know d brackets some letter has other definitions associated with it in mathematics so let's do just an example of working out the degrees of these vertices so the easiest way for you to actually figure out the degrees is to just say okay here we have u we have an edge coming there and an edge coming there so the degree of u is equal to 2 okay let's look at w w only has one edge coming you know connecting it it's the end vertice of only one edge so we have the degree of w is 1 okay so let's discuss the loop because the loop is a fun one because the whole idea behind this is the number of edges with the vertice v as the end vertex so when you look at that and when you think about it she's like okay there that edge has it as the end vertex but technically it's also end vertice over there and then you have that one that's coming in there so in regards to this the loop contributes two to the degree of the vertex so the degree of u is equal to three in this case because it had it is the end vertice three times okay so let's just write, say that again your degree of your vertice is the number of edges with the vertice v as the end vertex so when you're thinking about the degree you're going to be thinking about you know how many times is it the end vertice and if you think about it like that in that way of the definition you will see that your loop in that case you know it's an end vertice there it's end vertice for that and it's end vertice for that one so the loop itself counts two and then obviously your normal edges will count one for every single one that there are that there is if we had to add another you know a parallel edge between u and z then the degree of this will be bumped up one and the degree of that one won't be bumped up one so you'll see 
again, you'll count the number of times that vertice is an end vertice. Okay, now we know what degrees of the vertices are, we're going to define our new set of descriptors for the different vertices in terms of the degree. So the first one is the pendant vertex, and the pendant vertex is basically a vertex whose degree is 1. And the whole idea comes from the fact, like, you know, when you have a pendant, it's, you know, that kind of a, like a situation. So it's kind of giving you that shape. Obviously, you know for an edge to exist, it has to have another edge there. But when we refer to this, we're saying that that one over there is a pendant vertex. Let's just pretend that there is another one over there just to make things slightly more interesting. Okay, so it's that pendant shape. Then you have a pendant edge, and an edge that has a pendant vertice as an end vertex is a pendant edge. So again, in the situation over here, because that was a pendant vertex, that is a pendant edge. Right. Uh, next up is an isolated vertex. So an isolated vertex is just one that's chilling by itself. So it's going to be like a situation of, well, actually, I, I drew an example there, so I didn't have to draw that. W itself is an isolated vertex. It has a degree W is equal to zero. So that's an isolated vertex. If we look at this diagram at the bottom, the a pendant vertex in this situation is V. V is a pendant vertex. And Z is a pendant vertex. So remember the degree of V is equal to 1. And the degree of Z is equal to 1. Then you have the case of, you know, UV is a pendant edge. And you have uz is a pendant edge because it's connected to a pendant vertex so one of the things that's going to happen is your graphs are not necessarily going to be all nice small and compact and easy to draw and easy to look at so there's two important concepts which help you describe the overall look of the graph and that is the minimum and maximum degree of the graph. And the words kind of tell you what they mean. So if you're asked for the minimum degree of the graph, it's asking you for the smallest degree value of any of the vertices. Because it's going to create the minimum and maximum degree of a graph. It's going to create bounds in which you'll be able to know how much the vertices are connected to each other. So the minimum degree of a graph, it is basically the lowest vertex degree value of any of the vertices in the graph. And it is denoted by the lowercase delta, in case you don't know what delta is, it's that symbol over there. So what this is saying, it is saying it's the minimum degree of graph G. And then you have the maximum degree, and it's obviously the biggest degree value of any of the vertices in the graph. Maximum degree of a graph, and it's denot denoted by capital delta, which is just basically a triangle. Okay, and again, it's saying it's the maximum degree of graph G. So let's just rewrite that again maximum degree of graph G. So let's do an example. And let's draw a graph. Right, so we have a graph over there. Now, if you had to go and find out the degrees of every single vertice, that's actually what you do when you find out the minimum and maximum. You look at the degrees of every single vertice. But in this regard, it's a little bit easier to see the minimum degree because there's an isolated vertex there. Can't get lower than zero. Okay, so you know what the minimum, de minimum degree is. Is equal to zero. So what's the maximum degree? So now you can go ahead and find the degrees of all the different vertices. If you go look there, you have this one over here is two. 
that one is one one is really bigger than two that one is one again one one two three so the maximum degree is three okay so you go work out the degrees of all the vertices so if i had to label this i would have d1 d2 d3 d4 d5 and d6 i'll go calculate the degree of b1 the degree of b2 and so on and then i'll take the smallest value and the largest value and that's it it's just giving you a very broad description of what the graph can look like by indicating how many connections it has or, and how little connections it can have like every node of the vertices Okay, so another really important factor to consider when you're looking at graphs and you're describing graphs is, again, the idea that the actual visual representation of a graph can be quite tedious to draw. And sometimes you just kind of want the outline, you know, the, the bare basics, like the same kind of thing that when you walk into a room and you see, oh, there's five people, you don't necessarily want or care about all the little details involving like where they're sitting, you know, what they're doing and all that kind of stuff. So this is, you know, the descriptors to help give you a broad idea about the graph itself. Kind of, again, like if you're walking in and you saw a group of people, you just went like, okay, it's approximately 20 people. Um, they are all first years or they are all postgrads. That would be enough to, you know, get you going in acclimatizing yourself to what's happening, basically. So we're going to start off with the definition of an order. And the order of a graph is basically just the number of vertices in the graph. So one of the things that we're going to just discuss here is the fact that I use the bars here for the vertices like that. So in set theory, when you do have those, you usually know them as absolute value kind of bars, it is indicating what this is saying, the, the absolute value bars with the vertices set inside of it is telling you that it's looking at the number of elements in that set so it's the number of vertices of the graph that it is looking at so if we go to the example the number of vertices for this graph over here we have one two three four so the order of this graph is equal to four it's the number of vertices so let's just also just do this uv w z and we can write this as the number of elements in the vertices set v is equal to four okay so let's just do that one more time just so you can get comfortable and familiar with the notation we're going to first write down the vertices set so we have the vertices set of the graph g let's just call this one graph g is equal to and you're going to have u v w and z then we're going to say the number of elements of the vertices set of the graph g is equal to and then we just count the number of elements four that also means that the order of graph g is equal to four right now the size of the graph is the number of edges. So the size is your number of relationships. And that kind of makes sense because again, you're looking at a system, you're investigating, you know, the links between the different objects, you know, you're looking at those patterns of the relationships. So the size would be the number of relationships that there are. So the size of the graph is the number of edges of that graph. So in this case, the size would be one, two, three. The size of G is equal to three. Now you can also pause this and actually go and label the graph, um, label the edges of the graph, and then write out everything again. But just be aware, the number of elements in the multi, or in this case, it's just a set of the edges of G is equal to three because there are three edges. Okay, let's do it for the bottom one, which we're just going to label H. So our graphs don't have to always be called G. We can label them whatever we want. So that's graph H. And we're going to be, okay, what's the vertices set? 
the vertices set in this case is u and v let's do the edge set just to, you know practice it a bit so you're going to have uv and you're going to have uu okay so now we have the number of elements in the vertices set is equal to 2 and the number of elements in the edge set is equal to 2 and again so now the order of the graph is 2 Ooh, big mistake I made there I labeled the graph G um, H and I kept writing G because I was just so used to writing G you should just be aware of that and be consistent